one. Music hold ended. Hello, I'm Dana Marie Kennedy from AARP Arizona. Thank you for joining us today. And I want to welcome you to this important discussion about the coronavirus. AARP is a nonprofit, nonpartisan member organization and has been working to promote the health and well being of Americans 50 plus for more than 60 years. In the face of the global coronavirus pandemic, AARP is providing information and resources to help Americans 50 plus and those caring for them. The Delta variant is spreading across our nation, leaving businesses and state governments struggling to respond. AARP urges all eligible Americans to get the vaccine as well as the booster shot when it's available to ensure they stay protected from the deadly coronavirus and put an end to this pandemic once and for all. I think we're all grateful that 2020 is in the rearview mirror. COVID, of course, is still with us and will be for some time. Fortunately, more than 169 million Americans are vaccinated. Millions of Americans are going back to work and children are going back to school. None of us knows what lies ahead with the virus. All we can do is keep taking precautions, recommendations by the CDC, and to protect our health and that of our children and grandchildren. Today, we're looking ahead and we'll hear from a very special guest, Dr. Richard Carmona, and special about how we can combat COVID together and the latest about the vaccine distribution in Arizona. If you participated in one of our telecom halls, you know this is similar to a radio talk show and you have the opportunity to ask questions live. For those of you joining us on the phone, if you would like to ask a question about the coronavirus pandemic, press star three on your telephone to be connected with an AARP staff member who will note your name and question and place you in the queue to ask the question live. If you're listening through our Facebook audio stream, please leave your questions in the comment section. We have folks join our call while I have been speaking, and I want to extend a welcome. I am Dana Marie Kennedy with AARP Arizona, and I want to thank you for joining this important discussion on the global coronavirus pandemic. We're we're talking with leading experts and taking your questions live. Dr. Richard Carmona, the 17th Surgeon General of the United States, is advising Governor Doug Ducey and the Arizona Department of Health Services on the state's response to the COVID-19 pandemic and public health emergency preparedness. After serving as Surgeon General from 2002 to 2006, Dr. Carmona became the Vice Chairman of the Canyon Ranch, a Tucson wellness resort where he now serves as Chief Health Innovations. A member of several corporate boards, Dr. Carmona also serves as a distinguished professor of public health at the University of Arizona's Mel and Enid Sepperman College of Public Health while also holding faculty appointments as a professor of Surgeon General and Pharmacy. Thank you, Dr. Carmona. The floor is yours. Thanks so much. Uh, Happy to be with you today and thanks very much to AARP for allowing us this opportunity to communicate with your members, of which I am one, and also uh, Happy to be with my colleague, uh, Jessica Riggler, who is the Assistant Director for Preparedness, Public Health Preparedness at Arizona Department of Health Services. It's an important issue as you've outlined. And I think most importantly, I wanna put it in perspective that um, vaccines are probably, arguably, the most important advancement in the science in the history of mankind. Because you think of all of the diseases that once plagued us, measles, mumps, rubella, whooping cough, tetanus, and so many others, and those are all vaccinatable diseases. Now as a nation and a world, we're challenged with a new invisible threat, this COVID virus. And yet in a remarkably short amount of time, we've developed a vaccine that's proven to be safe and efficacious. And that's our ticket to be able to return to uh, our new normal. Uh, This is not only a health issue, it's an economic issue, as you've seen lots of unemployment, lots of debt being accumulated, families are struggling, and really we have this tool in our toolbox called a vaccine that can turn that all around. So the quicker we can accelerate the majority of our citizens, if not all of our citizens if possible, getting vaccinated, the more likely it is we'll be able to return to the lives that we had and you know resume a healthy life and get our businesses going again and reverse the negative economic impact that this has occurred. So once again, thanks so much 
I'm certainly happy to answer any questions you may have with my colleague, Jessica, who you'll hear from momentarily. Thank you, Dr. Carmona. And again, this is Dana Kennedy, State Director with AARP Arizona, and you're listening to a Teletown Hall. And if you would like to ask a question, please press star three, and a staff member will will talk to you and help you, hopefully put you through. I'd now like to introduce Jessica Riggler, an Arizona native. She began her public health career more than 15 years ago, serving as varied roles with the local, state, and federal and international public health agencies. Jessica has been with the Arizona Department of Health Services for over 12 years, supporting evaluation activities with the state immunization program, serving as the state's first healthcare associate infection coordinator, and leading the Bureau of Epidemiology and Disease Control. She is currently an assistant director overseeing the Division of Public Health Preparedness at Arizona Department of Health Services, which spans the areas of epidemiology, disease control, emergency medical services, public health statistics, public health emergency preparedness, and the Arizona Public Health Laboratory. In recent years, Jessica has worked with the Arizona Department of Health Services team to lead critical public health responses, including opioids and COVID-19. Jessica holds a bachelor's degree from biochemistry and human development from the University of California, San Diego, and a master's degree in public health from Emory University. She is a certified health education specialist and certified in infection control. Thank you so much for joining us today, Jessica. The floor is now yours. Thank you, Dana, uh, to you and AARP for having us today. I'm honored to be at this town hall with Dr. Carmona to answer your questions um, and to share information that we have. It's such a tremendous opportunity. Um, we're very excited with the progress of the vaccine rollout in Arizona and the prospect of being able to come closer to herd immunity and um, achieve a more normal state in the face of COVID-19 here. Uh, there's been a lot of really great developments related to booster doses and their availability throughout the state. And we're looking ahead towards being able to vaccinate children as well, many of them being your grandchildren. Um, so we're really seeing uh, the tide starting to shift here and are, are looking forward to this forward momentum and progress. Uh, I am very interested to hear your questions though and see what kind of information that Dr. Carmona and I can provide in order to help um, increase your understanding or any information that you might need from us. Thank you, Dana. Thank you. We know this is extremely timely with all the information that's coming out lately. So if you have joined our call, I'm Dana Marie Kennedy from AARP in Arizona, and this is a live teletown hall to talk about the latest developments with coronavirus and news about vaccine distribution plans in Arizona. We're talking with Dr. Richard Carmona, the 17th Surgeon General of the United States. Dr. Carmona is advising Governor Ducey and the Arizona Department of Health Services on the state's response to COVID-19 pandemic and the public health emergency preparedness. And also speaking with Jessica Riggler from the Arizona Department of Health Services. As I stated earlier, this is an interactive call. So if you would like to ask a question at any time during the call, please press star three on your telephone keypad to be connected with an AARP staff member who will note your name and question and place you in the queue. The sooner you press star three, the sooner you'll be online with our guests. If you're listening through Facebook live stream, please, your questions in the comment section. Um, so we'll go ahead and I'll go ahead and kick off the questions. Um, what is the current status of the vaccine distribution plan in Arizona and what should listeners do if they want to get the vaccine? Were you trying to talk, Dr. Cumberland? I think you might be on mute. Uh, yeah. I was saying that uh, let's get Jessica to answer that one first because she has really been the leader of this for the entire state since the beginning and a real champion on, on uh, moving vaccine, vaccines out to the public. Thank you, Dr. Carmona. We have um, very good coverage of COVID-19 vaccination among eligible populations in, in Arizona, and that coverage is especially high among our older Arizonans, which is great because um, those are the individuals who are much more susceptible to severe disease. We also have um, ample supply of COVID-19 vaccines here in the state. And so individuals who haven't been vaccinated yet or who are ready to get their booster dose uh, should be able to visit a neighborhood pharmacy or any number of healthcare providers across the state to go and, and get their shot. Um, we do offer a website. It's azhealth.gov slash find vaccine. 
And on that website, you can go to identify locations near you that are offering the vaccine. We also have a call center that's available for folks to call into um, that can answer those same questions about where there are vaccination locations nearest to them. Thank you, Jessica. And how can people find out where to get the vaccine? Well, I think that's Jessica, I think that's the same answer. Uh, we have the website, we have the call in lines, um, and certainly uh, there is uh, ample information that's out there. I mean, even I actually, before we went on this, I actually just Googled and there's a whole host of uh, areas here in Arizona and groups like AARP that have been instrumental in getting this information out. So the, the uh, numbers and the website that uh, Jessica spoke to you about plus AARP, especially for this population is an important way to get information to answer those questions. Thank you. And for those who are taking it, taking information down, um, a good phone number you can call is 1-844-542-8201. And you'll want to select option eight. That will connect you with our vaccine navigators who can help you identify a location to get vaccinated. Otherwise, you can visit our website. That's azhealth.gov slash find vaccine. Thank you, Jessica and Dr. Carmona. And am I still protected from the virus if I only got one dose of the vaccine? Well, I'll start and uh, and I would say that yes, you are. The, the immediate vaccine that you get causes a rise in the antibodies. Antibodies are the way your body is gonna fight the virus. But we found out, again, remember that we're only a year and a half into this and nobody's ever had to deal with this before. So a lot of the information is coming out periodically as scientists get more information. We do know now that uh, the two dose, Pfizer for instance, uh, that it achieves a good immunity, but in some cases it looks like it starts to drop at six, seven, eight months. So the recommendation is to get the booster after that. And so um, you do have some immunity, even with the first dose, no question but you get another boost when you get the second dose. Got it. And I'm gonna go ahead and ask this question because I get asked this question a lot and I'm not a public health expert. What if I recovered from COVID? Um, do I have antibodies and how long do those antibodies last and should I still get a vaccine? Jessica, you know, that's a question that we get all the time. And I know Jessica's answered it a lot. I'll, I'll just jump in, but I'd like you to hear what she says too. Um, uh, yes, if you are infected, you do get antibodies. The question is how long do they last? Again, this is the first time we've been checking antibodies on people who have that. And some of the early studies show that they do drop off. So that's why it is recommended that you get the vaccine because it gives you a boost and gives you more protection. But Jessica, do you wanna comment as well? I would absolutely second everything that you've said, Dr. Carmona, uh, that COVID-19 vaccine um, will offer you the most robust protection to COVID-19, uh, even when coupled with someone who has been infected previously. So we would absolutely recommend that you be vaccinated, even if you've been infected with COVID-19. Excellent. And should I get a booster shot and when will they be available? Well, depending on your age group and such, you've probably read about this already, and Jessica has a lot of information on that now, but boosters are available for Pfizer, Moderna, and J&J &J are coming very soon. And of course, we're looking at children getting vaccinated soon as well. Hopefully in the next few weeks, we'll be able to move forward on that. So for the um, populations that have had the uh, Pfizer uh, vaccine, you can get your booster shot. Again, the uh, the information that Jessica gave you as far as phone number websites will help with that. And um, as I said, Moderna and J&J &J probably are going to be following soon. Another question maybe you haven't asked comes up, can we mix and match? And in fact, that's a discussion that's going on right now. And the science appears to suggest that you can mix and match and, and get benefit from that. But the official announcement will come from CDC soon. Jessica, do you have some more to add? Yes, we would strongly encourage booster doses, just as Dr. Carmona has said, and we expect that uh, the Moderna and Johnson & Johnson booster dose recommendation should come out in the next day or two, uh, but 
again, like Dr. Carmona mentioned, if you've been vaccinated with Pfizer and it's been more than six months, it's time to go get your booster. And who's eligible for a booster shot? Booster doses uh, for are currently recommended for individuals who are 65 years of age and older. Uh, for those individuals that are between 18 and 64, if you've got an underlying medical condition like diabetes or a heart condition or a lung condition, you're also recommended uh, to get a booster dose with Pfizer. And then also those individuals who are in frontline work where they're interacting with the public very often or they're at a higher risk for COVID-19, those individuals are also recommended for a booster. So it's a very wide breadth of our population who would be recommended to get a booster at this time. Excellent, thank you. Um, and there have been reports about mutations of the virus that are now in the United States. What do we know about how well the vaccine works against these new mutations? Well, the, these, are, these are mutations that lead to what's called variants. So that virus is trying to survive in our environment as much as we're trying to survive. It's a real competition because the virus changes because it sees that it's being challenged with vaccines and in, in some cases other medications that people are trying. And so we expect that this will occur. And I think what the public needs to know is that bacteria, viruses mutate all the time because they're trying to survive in the environment. In this particular case with COVID, we don't have a long history uh, with it because we just picked up on this 19, 20 months ago. But what we do know is this particular variant that we have now, the Delta variant, seems to be more transmissible. What we also know is the longer it gets to circulate in the population that among people that aren't vaccinated, the more chances it has to mutate further, create a variant that then is even more difficult and maybe eventually that the vaccine doesn't work as well, which is why you hear the urgency from Jessica and myself, from the governor, uh, from Don Harrington, our director, to say we've got to get people vaccinated quickly because it's the passport for us to return to normal. At some point when you achieve herd immunity, meaning that a large majority of the population is vaccinated, the virus has nowhere to go and then we resume our life. The longer we wait to get to that point, the virus has lots of opportunity to keep changing and come up with a new variant. And so think about, uh, for those of us in the AARP age group, of course, remember polio, okay? And I remember as a youngster, my mom was always afraid to send us to school because she saw the pictures of children in iron lungs because they got this disease. And then Dr. Sabin and Salk came along with the vaccine and it spread throughout the world and now you don't hear about polio anymore. And in places where we have measles or mumps, rubella, whooping cough, tetanus, you don't see those diseases anymore. What do they have in common? They're all vaccinatable diseases. And COVID is simply another vaccinatable disease that we picked up on and in the fastest time in history have come up with a way to prevent it. And that's really the important information for the public. This is no different then you all taking your children to school and the pediatrician and getting a series of vaccinations so that disease doesn't spread in school and in the community. Same thing here. There's nothing special other than this is a new virus and we figured out how to vaccinate against it. So we are pleading with all of the members of AARP to make sure you and your families get vaccinated. This is not only for you, it's for your kids and your grandkids so that you don't inadvertently spread disease to them. Jessica, I'll stop and turn it over to you. I couldn't say it any better if I tried, Dr. Carmona. That was great. Thank you. That was really well received and a really strong message everybody needs to hear. So as we proceed, remember, if you would like to ask a question, press star three on your telephone keypad to be connected with an AARP staff member who will note your name and question. The sooner you press star three, the sooner you'll be online with our guest. Now I'd like to ask the, the members of the on the call a question, how likely are you to get COVID-19 booster shot? Um, press one on your telephone keypad if you already got it. Press two if you're planning to get it. Press three if you want to learn more about the booster vaccine before getting it. And press four, I plan, to, I plan not to get the booster vaccine. Again, how likely are you to get the COVID-19 booster back, vaccine? One, already got it two, planning to get it, three, want to get more information about the booster before getting it, and or three, and four, I do not plan to get the booster. 
So again, um, I will now turn it over to Alex Suarez, our AARP Arizona Communications Director for Participant Questions. Alex? Thank you, Dana. I appreciate it. And uh, what an excitement. And uh, I am so proud and honored uh, to be hosting this along with you, Dana, and having Dr. Carmona, Richard Carmona, and Jessica Rigler from the Arizona Department of Health Services. So thank you so much for being part of this uh, town hall for our members. So we have uh, a lot of questions on the queue. So we are going to start uh, with Cottonwood. We are going to go to uh, Leslie. Leslie, can you hear us? I can. Can you hear Please me? Go ahead with your question. Okay. Yes, so I, my main question is, I already had COVID. I did get the J&J shot a couple months after. Do I still really need to get the booster if I've had both COVID and the shot? Great question. Yes, you, get sure. you want me to go? Go ahead, Dr. Carmona. Okay. Well, I think we've got a great partnership here, you know, the team. So, I mean, really either, either one of us, any of us can answer these questions, but we're happy to. First of all, thank you so much for the question. It is a very pertinent question because we get that question all the time, not necessarily from Moderna or J&J, but do I need another vaccination since I've already been infected? And, and the answer is yes, that it gives you a additional immunity. And so, you know, we, we understand that you have some immunity from being exposed but the immunity with the vaccine is additive and better, and it protects you even more. And so that's the reason. Right, but to I've go already had the vaccine. I have had the that's vaccine. Good. Yes, yes. So my question good. is, on top of COVID and the vaccine, do you still need to get the booster? Yes, ma'am. I'm, I'm sorry that I wasn't clear then. Yes, you should, because that's the continuum. You know, think about it. Uh, again, we're learning a lot about the science of this now. If you look at our mm -hmm. children that get They'll get vaccines at one year old and two years old and three years old or six month intervals because we have a better understanding of those diseases than childhood. Right now, to complete the series, you get the booster. In the future, we may look at this not as a booster, but a series of two or three vaccines that you get to protect you from this disease. Okay, and in fact, there are a number of labs now working on including COVID in the annual flu vaccine just for that reason. So. Um, your, your question is terrific, and yes, I would suggest that you do get, finish the series and get the booster. Thank you, Leslie, for your question. Uh, we're going to move right along, and uh, this time we're going to go to Sun City West. In Sun City West, we have uh, Judith. Judith, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Please go ahead with your question. My question is, I've had the J and J vaccine, but how do I choose which booster? How do I know how it's going to interact? Are they made from different approaches? I don't understand how to make that decision. Jessica, you want to go with that, and uh, I'll jump on after you. Sure. Yes. Um, and I thank you, Judith, for that question because I'm sure it's a question a lot of people have as well. Uh, we're waiting for the final recommendation to come out from CDC, but our understanding is, um, based on what FDA has said already this week, that mm -hmm. any one of those vaccines is going to be a good vaccine to boost with. Um, Moderna and Pfizer are much more widely available in pharmacies throughout the state, so it's likely when you go to get your booster dose that it will be one of those two dose types that you would get a booster dose with. Uh, but we would recommend that you get vaccinated with a booster dose of, of whatever's available. There's a lot of science out there that is showing dramatically increased protection um, or increased antibody response with a Moderna dose following a Moderna booster dose following a Johnson and Johnson um, vaccination. However, we would recommend that you go get a booster dose and any kind of booster dose will be a good booster dose. Uh, the, the science points to Moderna being just the best level of protection for you. Dr. Carmona, anything else you want to add to that? I would just say that perfect, perfectly said, I couldn't say it any better, and, and that if you're worried about any complications that one counteracts the other, or, no, there's no, no information at all that there's adverse effects by switching to the other. And as Jessica said, the, the, from I said it from day one, actually, when people would ask, well, which should I get? Which is the best? The best vaccine is the one you get now, however you get it. That's the best vaccine. Okay. When I Judith, thank you so much for your question. 
Uh, this time we're going to go to Tucson, and in Tucson we have Susan. Susan, can you hear us? Yes. Go ahead with your question, Susan. Yes, my question is I've had the vaccine, and um, I'm waiting on the booster shot. I was wondering, I also get a flu shot every year. Is this vaccine good now, or do we have to have more vaccines like we do flu shots every year? Great question. Jessica, you want to start, or do you want me to? Whatever, whatever you like. Go ahead, Dr. Cremona. Thank you. Okay. So um, it's, it's a very common question, a common question now. It is estimated that we will probably have to have a COVID vaccine every year, every six months. As the data comes out, we don't know exactly for sure, but the COVID is going to be with us for some time. Even though we extinguish it and it won't be able to transmit to anybody because people are vaccinated, it'll still be there. But much like children get, you know, their, their boosters as well, when you get measles and mumps and rubella, that, you know, it bumps up the immunity again because we know the virus is still out there. Polio is still out there. It's hard to find, uh, except in some very remote areas in the world, but yet we don't see it because people get vaccinated against it. And so I would expect, yes, you would. As I mentioned a little earlier, there are some labs actually looking at the ability to maybe just include COVID into the annual flu vaccine, for instance, because it is a coronavirus and it's very similar. So Yes, I would expect that we will be dealing with this as we go forward, but the good news is we know how to prevent the spread of disease and stop it from spreading if we get vaccinated. Can, I ask, more to, uh, can I ask one more to that? If we, if we just, will this be our decision or are they gonna say that it's mandatory that you know we get the vaccine next year or the shot like we do flu shots i know my children have not gotten it and they're grown adults and that is their choice to you know just like it was my choice to get the vaccine but does this progress for us all next year that this will be something that we must get every year instead of the choice like you get with the flu shot or do you know well i, I think nobody knows that answer right now and I okay can, i know that the way we have been looking at this, the issue of mandates has divided our country, you know, and it's unfortunate that it has, but we have to recognize that's, that's what's happened. Our goal is to make sure that all of you have the right information to be able to make the best decision for your family. From our standpoint, there's no downside in getting a vaccine because at most your arm may be a little sore, you may feel a little achy for a little while, but when you consider the huge benefit preventing you from getting bad disease, certainly worth the effort to do that. So again, we're the, the, the issue of mandates or no mandates become political ones for Jessica and I and the Arizona Department of Public Health. We want to make sure you're empowered with the best information to be able to make the best decision for you to uh, make sure your family and you are healthy. Jessica. Thank you. Yes, Dr. Carmona. Uh, and Susan, I also want to thank you for bringing up the flu vaccine um, as a part of your question. Uh, it's so important right now as we're into influenza season for people to get vaccinated against the flu too. And so I'm thrilled that you'll, you're will you planning to go out and get your influenza shot and we'll encourage everyone to do the same. Uh, we had a very mild season last season, but we are anticipating uh, an increase in influenza cases this season compared to last season. And again, the flu shot is the best protection that we have against the flu as well. Uh, also, you can get your COVID booster at the same time as you get your influenza shot. So it's a really great time to be considering getting your flu shot right now. Hey, Jessica, that was a good point as well. Uh, people have asked, can I get them together? Absolutely. No problem. You can get them together. And this is especially important for some of our seniors, being we're speaking to ARP because transportation may be a difficulty. They may be in a rural area. It's hard to get to a clinic or a doctor. Get them all done at the same time. And, and that, that, that'll be very helpful to you, and you don't have to worry about that second or third trip. Okay. Thank you for your question, Susan. And uh, Dr. Carmona and uh, Jessica Dino, uh, I have the results, the poll results, which are fairly interesting here. So the question was, how likely are you to get the COVID-19 booster vaccine? One, it was uh, already got it, 24%, planning to get it, 55%, want to learn more about a booster vaccine before getting it, 
and I do not plan to get the, the booster vaccine. It's 5%. Why is there still some hesitancy, Dr. Cremona and Jessica? I mean, I think the science has proven that the, the vaccine is safe. This is a worldwide health crisis. Why are we still having some hesitancy here? Well, you know what? First and foremost, thank you for the data because it helps Jessica and myself and others who think about these things all the time. I'm encouraged by the data because there's only a small percent saying no. There's there's maybe a hesitancy group there that's saying, well, maybe I want some more information. That gives us the opportunity to provide that information. So when I added up all those numbers, we're at, we can get the herd immunity, even if there's a small percent that don't want to. You know, it's, it's, um, it's a challenge of working in a democracy. You know, the perils of democracy that often the, the rights of the individual are butt up against the rights of society at large. And, you know, think of smoking. I dealt with that all the time as Surgeon General. People would say, well, I'm an American. I can smoke. You can't tell me not to. Yes, but your smoking is hurting other people. Your smoking is causing you to live 10 or 15 years young, less than you would. And you're going to die in your last few years with emphysema, pulmonary disease, maybe cancer. So we have to pay for that bad decision. So, you know, having these kind of conversations in the public uh, sphere is important that people understand that it's not only you doing it for yourself. Some of these decisions are for the greater good of your family, your community, and the nation that you say, okay, I won't smoke. I will wear a seatbelt. I will wear a helmet. Simple things that have changed the trajectory of morbidity and mortality. This is another one we're being challenged with, and we are as perplexed as you. There's no one solution to hesitancy. In other words, Jessica has spent a lot of time as, as our team at ACDHS to look at what are the incremental variables that contribute to hesitancy. For some, they just, you know, it's a government issue, I don't believe. For some, I don't understand. For some, maybe. So when you look across the board, And then you start to look at, well, what's the difference between hesitancy in a young population and an old population, or a Hispanic population, or an Anglo population, or an Asian population, and you start to see differences emerging there too, which speaks to the great diversity of this nation, which really makes us the best nation in the world, in my opinion, but yet paradoxically divides us every day. And that's the challenge that Jessica and and I and our colleagues have every day, recognizing the this this great passion of independence in this nation but trying to harness that energy sometimes at a time like this to get everybody on board to do the right thing to protect us jessica no that was great nothing to add thank you thank you dr carmona and jessica that's a great answer so we're going to go back to the questions and uh, this time we're going to go to levine and in levine we have uh, uh joanne joanne can you hear us Yes. Go ahead, please. Uh, my granddaughter will be 12 uh, December 8th. And I understand that the vaccine that's for the 11 year olds is a third of the dosage of that for 12 year olds. And so if it happens that they're, you know, it's approved that she could get the vaccine, you know, in a couple of weeks. Um, and then the second one. The second one would be after her her twelfth birthday. Should she go with the the lower dose um, or get the the uh, dosage that's for the twelve the sixteen year olds, which I understand is the adult dose? Jessica, how would you like to go? I was going to defer to you um, from your clinical okay. expertise, Dr. Carmona, okay. on that question. Thank sure. you. Jessica's being very kind. She has all this information as well and, and you know, loses sleep over it every night, like, like most of us. Um, I, I think first, first and foremost, making the decision for your, your, your children, grandchildren to get the vaccination is most important. Then, uh, again, we don't have the final information on a lot of these uh, as it relates to the 5 to 11, 12-year range. So um, the best thing to do is let's see what the, uh, what the recommendation is as far as dose. The other thing is is that it's important, check with your family pediatrician, the the doc who takes care of your children and get the recommendation of what they think at this point. There shouldn't be a problem. The reason that they check the different doses, I mean, children are a lot smaller body surface area and the idea was, well, do we need to give them that much of the antigen? The antigen is what stimulates you to make the antibody. And so there is uh, still science that's evolving in that area 
So I think that once this is approved, the, the um, guidance will be there exactly. But in a hypothetical, if she's on the 11th side and sets one and then on the 12th side gets another and the dosage happens to be a little different, it's really not going to make a difference. The most important thing is, is that the child gets immunized and boosted, and that would be the most important thing. But if any doubts, please check with the pediatrician, the doctor taking care of your children, grandchildren, to get the final guidance once the CDC and FDA put out the uh, final guidance to us. Jessica, any, any more to add? No, nothing else to add, thank you. Thank you, Joanne, for your question. Uh, this time we're gonna go to Levine, and Levine, we have uh, Beverly. Beverly, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. I believe my question has been answered, but I had uh, a three-part question. The first question was, um, I have taken both the Moderna vaccines and was wondering if um, the Moderna booster was available for me to take. And there was information saying that the Moderna vaccine would be a one-half dosage of that that I took previously. Um, if it's not available now, do you have an idea of when it's available? So that was three questions. Apologize if, um, and I'll repeat if you need me to. Thank you, Beverly. We'll go ahead and jump in there. As uh, Jessica said a little earlier, uh, should be hearing from uh, CDC, FDA about Moderna, J and J availability. Pfizer's the one that's been out there most. Uh, hence, we discussed the mix and match that uh, if you're ready for a booster and the one that's not the same that you took, for instance, Moderna, get the Pfizer, okay, because the science says it's going to give you the boost, the boost that you want. As far as the, the different dosages in adults, that's not really an issue. You generally are getting the same, the same vaccine that you had before. As we get more information, they may be able to say, they can change this a little bit, but even if they don't, there's no adverse outcome. So again, it's, I, want, I want to be clear on this one because for a lot of people, it gets confusing. The science is evolving every day, every week. Laboratories all over the country are contributing. Patients, patient experiments, you know, uh, control studies to decide on dosage, to decide on efficacy, to decide on um, that it's not harm. You know, what, what the FDA looks at is they want to make sure it's efficacious and it does no harm. Those are the two main criteria that they use for a vaccine or a drug. And so that takes a little bit of time. And I know the public has gotten frustrated. Why didn't they tell us this? But gosh, you know, from my side, this is amazing how quickly this information has come forward. And one of the reasons it has is a lot of scientists selflessly sharing information that normally they would hold on to because it's proprietary, because uh, from their company or their university, but you just can't believe the crowdsourcing that went on around the world and midnight emails between scientists around the world to share information so that we could make a vaccine real quickly. And this information is still coming in and makes us better. So I, I want you to be confident that once these um, regulatory agencies give their opinion, it's after a lot of deliberation and a lot of data. And there still will be more data that's going to drive us with changes as we move forward. And that's to be expected. We've consolidated something that takes many years usually into something that is, uh, you know, much faster. And so I'm, I'm pretty proud of how the scientific community has come together. And I've, I've said to my team too, it, the only thing I would do differently is, uh, in retrospect, is to figure out a way to have a better narrative, to have the public understand the process, that it's so complicated that it takes lots and lots of people sharing information to come to this conclusion. And we're seeing that right now. Wonderful. Thank you, Beverly, for the question. So we have about 15 minutes left. So we're going to do fast and furious round here of questions. We still have uh, many questions on the queue here. And this question is from Alfonso in, in Prescott. And you've kind of already answered the question about the, when will Moderna booster be available. He's asking in particular in Prescott. But uh, Alfonso, can you hear us there? Yes, I can. Okay. Uh, do you have an additional question? Or do you uh, yes, wanna, uh, I have uh, a question. I received the full uh, vaccination with Moderna, and it was about seven months ago. 
and I'm waiting to get the booster with Moderna. I need to know roughly how far that will carry me in the months ahead. If it's a dosage of, uh, I guess, half the percentage than it was normal. Well, you want to start, Jessica? Or you know, you know the answer just <laughs> like I do. So. <laughs> well, Alfonso, I, w I wish we could tell you with certainty the um, the exact length of time that booster will last. Um, and unfortunately, we there's not data that demonstrates um, when immunity or if immunity would wane following that booster. What we know is it's critical to get um, enhanced protection. It will help your body develop additional antibodies to fight the disease. Um, but we don't know at this time uh, whether or not there'll be a recommendation for another booster six from, months from now or one year from now. Um, so Dr. Carmona was discussing the science and the scientific process. We will continue to learn more and uh, the scientists will continue to amass that data for our federal entities to review so we can come out with future recommendations. But based on what we've seen at this time in the current recommendations, I would expect at least six months. Um, but like I said, this, the science will still trickle in. And Dr. Carmona, I don't know if you've Read anything additional or, or know of other information on that I think, topic? I think that's spot on. Uh, it's hard to tell. And I had a couple little things, but I think just because answer was perfect, that even though you see some of the immunity, the levels of the immune, by what they call IgA, IgG, IgM, which you don't need to memorize, but just these are the things they look for, they drop a little bit, but that doesn't mean you're not protected. So you need more data to be able to say, where does the protection actually get lost? And so when you look at the risk benefit analysis, we always err on the, on the point of saying, you know what, it's dropping a little, let's not take any chances, let's give the person the booster because there's no downside. Other than you have a little bit of sore arm or you feel a little crummy, but when you think about the immense protection you're getting from going to the hospital, from being on a ventilator and from dying, this is a real simple decision to make. Get the booster as quickly as you can. And if you can't get the one that you, you know, started with, that's okay. The information that Jessica and I both know that okay, will be coming out very soon is that it's okay to switch over because you get the boost from the other one if you got a different one. Great. Thank you, Alfonso. You're quite on for information about Moderna coming very soon, um, in particular in Prescott there. This time we're going to go to Mojave Valley, and we have uh, Alfred on the line. Alfred, can you hear us? Yes, I can. I'm trying to figure out all the information that you people are putting out. I'm trying to figure out, does the shot help me, or does the shot help the people around me? Ah, great question. Jessica, go for it. That's, that's a softball. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, both, both, sir. Um, the shot will absolutely help you and protect you from not just getting COVID-19, but from severe outcomes associated with COVID-19, like hospitalizations or need for ventilation or death. Uh, but the shot also helps protect those around you. So if you're vaccinated, you're less likely to get sick with COVID-19, which then means you're less likely to spread that disease to others in your family or in your neighborhood or your community. You know, at this point, we have uh, folks in our community that are too young to be vaccinated or individuals who may be immunocompromised and so they don't have uh, as strong of a reaction to the vaccine to produce those antibodies to protect them. So not only does getting vaccinated protect you, but it, it keeps you from acquiring the disease, which stops you from spreading it to those other more vulnerable members of the community. Right. Right. Great. Thank you, Alfred, for the question. Did you have anything else to add, Dr. Carmona? Nope. No, as usual, Jessica, spot on. Excellent. Very good. Uh, this time we're moving to point south to Tucson. And in Tucson, we have John. John, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Go uh, ahead, please. Okay. I have uh, two problems. I have major heart problems and I have diabetes to be, uh, also. I've taken the two uh, Moderna uh, uh, shots. Yes. Uh, um, yeah, doses, and I, I'm, I'm 78 years old. I heard something is this is kind of I, I hope you can answer this one. It was about uh, a week ago, it, and it said like uh, they found uh, that Moderna was uh, causing 
uh, uh, clots in the blood. And uh, it wasn't, it was like a major like thing. It was about five, uh, five or six or seven days ago. And I was just wondering, you know, this might be like where it's like, uh, like uh, 0.007%. Uh, so I wouldn't worry about that. But I was wondering, uh, I would like to kind of know that because uh, that's where I'm really having problems with in clots in my system. And, and so I was thinking of just switching over to uh, um, what the other one, uh, Pfizer. I don't know whether Pfizer. they've had problems. Yeah. So do you know anything about that, Mike? Sure. Well, I'm happy to comment. And first, thanks, thanks so much for your question, because there are many senior citizens like yourself who have a multitude of problems that place them at increased risk, diabetes, hypertension, you know, things like that all make you more susceptible. But as far as the complications, there are some very rare isolated cases reported. And if you have a problem with coagulation, again, I'm not be giving medical advice directly to you. I'm going to give you a general comment that if there's any question, you should speak to your physician who is taking care of you for those particular things, a clotting problem, the diabetes, and so on, to see if he or she might suggest you do something else. But what I will tell you that the complications are, have been reported. They're very rare, okay, and they can be picked up and they can be treated. But again, uh, for you and because of the general description you gave of your background, I'd say have that discussion with your physician who cares for you and get the guidance from them because they know you better than anybody. Thank you, John, for your question. Uh, we're staying in Tucson, and in Tucson we have uh, Susan Susan, can you hear us? Yes, yes. Um, my, Go ahead. I, uh, my question is similar. I'm 83 and I have very compromised lungs. I'm on oxygen. I had the two Modernas um, eight months ago. But I was kind of concerned about the fact that Moderna was only giving a half because I obviously want the maximum protection I can get. And what I've seen, I saw a a statement in, in the Wall Street Journal, a person from the FDA advisory panel, saying that, well, they only did a small study and they had mixed results and that it was more of a gut feeling than, than really science. But we, we, we think that, you know, this, this is a good way to go. And I thought, boy, that doesn't sound very promising. Um, and um, in another one, they said, why are you giving a half? And they said, well, it'll decrease adverse effects and it'll leave more vaccine for others who need it. So all of, you know, so now I'm wondering, should I, I mean, would it be better for me at this point to get the Pfizer, which at least is a full dose? Or would I okay. stay with the Moderna, which is only half? Or should I pretend I'm immunocompromised and go get a whole one? I mean, I, I really don't know what's, what's best to do. Well, th yeah, thank you question. for the question. You know, and, and, and thanks for the question. And, and it really, uh, you know, uh, highlights some of the confusion that's out there because the media runs these stories. In the beginning, there were stories about, well, you know, uh, this vaccine is, is uh, better than that vaccine and so on. And the public would start to see numbers, 75%, 80%. So, of course, they go, well, let me get the bigger number. And really, those scientific numbers don't translate to you being able to make a decision because on all the three vaccines, they are pretty much equally effective in preventing you from dying, preventing you from being on a ventilator, and preventing you from serious complications. You know, and, and the, 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 the challenge, of course, is, is that the public was thinking that this prevents me from getting the disease. It does most of the time. But most importantly, if you happen to get it, it gives you a mild disease most of the time. And that's what's really important. So in your case, as far as the doses, I can understand how that could be very confusing. And what's happening is they're trying to determine the lowest dose necessary to give you the maximal immune response so that your immunity stays up. So we've done it in children. You know, the, a child is not simply a small, big person. Their immune systems are different. Blood volume is different. So they say, okay, this is how much we're going to give children because they don't need to have the full dose. This is done with antibiotics as well, you know, which is something you probably, you know, taken some time in your life. The dosage has changed depending on the antibiotic and what it's given for and, and your size. So 
um, in your particular case, I don't think it, the article may have said it was guessing, and I don't know the article specifically, but there is a scientific validity to doing that, that you want to give a dose that will give you the best response, but that not necessarily the old dose, because you don't need that at that point. And that data is still coming in. So I would say whatever booster you're entitled to, that's the one you should get now. Uh, if you can't get that one, get another one, as we discussed here. Any of those three will give you the additional boost. And don't pay attention to the dose so much, because that's more for the scientific uh, community to decide, uh, as, again, what is the minimum amount of this antigen or stimulus that I'm giving to this person to get the maximum immune response, okay? So I, but I do understand how confusing it gets, and sometimes I'm reading these articles in the newspaper and I say, why are they saying that? It's just gonna confuse people more. This is more for scientific guidance for, for folks, and to have this conjecture of, well, because we need more vaccine and we'll divide it, you know, that's all somebody's opinion. That's not, that's not science. Jessica, jump in, please. I don't think I have anything else to add on that. I um, definitely hear you, Susan, on how there's so much information coming out there that it's really difficult to cull through it. But um, a booster dose of whichever one is available is going to be the best thing uh, to provide you with additional protection. Thanks. Wonderful. Thank you so much for those questions. And we're almost running out of time. So we're going to go to Oro Valley real fast and talk to Ethel. Ethel, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Thank you. Go ahead, please. Um, my question, well, I had a couple. One was answered through listening to everybody. Um, but the other one is I understand that there are two tests available to test for COVID. One, they it takes uh, two, three days to get the response of the results. And the other one, I hear it's called a fast test. You can go in, do it, and they can tell you in 20 minutes. And I want to know what is what is the difference between the two tests as relates to which one better identifies if you do or do not have COVID. Jessica, you want to jump on that one? I know you've been uh, kind of the testing guru for the state for a while. Well, I'll take a stab at it, Dr. Carmona, and then please okay. fill in any gaps that I leave. But um, oh. Ethel, much like vaccines, uh, there are, of course, a whole variety with, when it comes to testing, and there's different information out there about all these kinds of tests, too. Uh, so the, the diagnostic test that takes a couple of days to turn results around, um, that test often has different sensitivity or specificity compared to that faster or more rapid test. Um, those are scientific terms that we use in our, um, our, our daily work here, but really what it means is how, how um, well it, it will do at detecting a true positive case in someone who has COVID or how well the test will do in identifying whether a person actually has a negative result or if it's going to give back a false negative. And there are a lot of different things that, um, that are dependent upon that, like whether or not the individual has symptoms uh, and, and those sorts of things. So part of that decision-making around the testing really is about um, your purpose. For example, if you're going in to visit someone um, today or tomorrow and you need to know your test result immediately because that person is very susceptible to disease, a rapid test is going to be great to just give you an immediate answer on what you need to know. Um, that, that two to three day long test sometimes is considered the gold standard in testing, but um, often you can see people who are testing positive on that test um, who had previously had COVID but haven't been infectious for a couple of days. So they, they, um, they what I would say is if you need testing, you should get a test that's available to you that's nearby. Um, we, we don't really have a preference with one test over the other test. Um, there can be cost differentials and those sorts of things on them. And as uh, turnaround times vary from place to place. So some of those that are two to three days turnaround in one location really only take 24 hours in another location as well. Dr. Carmona, you may be able to um, more succinctly sure, say sure. what I just yeah. said. Well, I got that on. You, were, you were right on with what you said. You know, one, the one test is um, more for screening and is easier to access. They tend to be a little cheaper and, and gives you a result in a reasonably quick amount of time. So that's kind of an, an antigen test. An antigen is just, it's a test that actually 
test your blood to see if a certain uh, molecule, chemical, is in there that would indicate that you have that you have COVID. Then there's a PCR test, and the PCR test is what they call a polymerase chain reaction. That's actually looking at the DNA of the virus and specifically identifying it. That's why it takes longer. And, you know, there's not as many people doing that because it's a more complex test. But as Jessica said, the, the, we have the two tests, and one is, one is more for rapid screening. And the other, if there's any question, you can use that it's more of a confirmatory test. And uh, neither one is right or wrong, but you just have to understand the risk and benefits of both. And that's why there are two tests that have developed. But Jessica put it very well. You know, if you want to know real quick, you need to go visit a friend or somebody that may be sick. Or sometimes they'll ask for a, a, a quick test for access to a building, you know, uh, or to go to a movie theater. You know, that's the way to do it, because otherwise uh, with the PCR, it's just not that fast. Dana, unfortunately, we are out of time, so I'm going to turn it back to you. Thank you. Alex, um, and on behalf of AARP Arizona, I want to thank you and everyone for taking part in today's Teletown Hall discussion on the coronavirus pandemic. We've been talking with Dr. Richard Carmona and Jessica Riggler from Arizona Department of Health Services. Thank you for joining us today. As we near the end of our call, would either of you like to follow up on any of the questions or share closing comments? Jessica, you want? Yeah, yes, uh, Dana, I just want to extend my thanks to you and to AARP for hosting this call and to everyone on the line, uh, whether or not you asked a question or were just listening today, thank you so much for um, being open and, and sharing your information and sharing with one another because I think that's so helpful. Um, if, if you haven't gotten anything else from today, we just really want to make sure that you understand that vaccines are safe and they're effective um, and any vaccine that's available and approved is, is the right vaccine to get. Dr. Carmona. Well, that's why I went after you because I knew I wouldn't have much to say. Uh, she, uh, Jessica summarized it real well, and really a uh, big shout out to AARP for hosting this and allowing us to connect to so many people, because Jessica and I and Don and Steve, the whole team, we're always spending a lot of time. How do we connect to all these populations that are all over the state? And you all have an enviable network to connect, especially to our most vulnerable, vulnerable population, our senior citizens. So really, thank you so much for allowing us to, to jump on your network and speak to your folks and Please send your send you know continue to send your questions. You know uh, Jessica gave you contact information in AZDHS. If there's anything troubling you, let us know, and we're happy to continue to engage with AARP when you feel it's necessary. So thank you very much. Thank you. I mean, I think that this telecom hall has been extremely timely, and we know more information keeps coming out. We knew that booster information people were getting a little confused. So we're really pleased that you were able to join us today to answer these questions that people have and address their concerns. So once again, um, AARP and Dr. Carmona and Jessica Riggler, um, in the face of this crisis, we're providing information and resources to help older adults and those caring for them protect themselves from the virus, prevent its spread to others while taking care of themselves. For more information about the coronavirus in Arizona, you can go to aarp.org forward slash AZ or call 1-888-687-2277. Thank you for participating in this discussion on this very important topic. We apologize if we were not able to get to your questions. We'll also obtain valuable information through our AARP publications on our website at aarp.org or by calling 1-888-687-2277. Thank you and goodbye. That's the conclusion of this call.